Welcome to the first University of Washington Taiwan Studies program event of our new academic year. My name is James Lin. I am an assistant professor of international studies at the Jackson School here at the University of Washington. Uh, and we are very happy to welcome with us today Ian Easton uh, to talk about our, our theme for today, which is Taiwan's defense. Um, so uh, before I, I introduce Ian, I just want to mention very quickly, we have a number of events for this upcoming academic year. Uh, we are very excited to have in the fall uh, soon a, a big public roundtable about Taiwan and China uh, in the aftermath, well, during the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine war. So this will be a large public roundtable that we will host within the Jackson School. Uh, we also are excited to have four talks about new books being published in Taiwan Studies, part of our annual new book lecture series. Uh, so the first one will be coming up uh, very soon in October by Professor Li Zhuqing, who will be talking about her new book, uh, a, a look at two sisters who are separated by the Taiwan Strait. Um, so today, uh, let me introduce our, our guest, Ian Easton. Uh, Ian is the senior director at the Project 2049 Institute. He's held previous positions at the Japan Institute for International Affairs, uh, the Center for Naval Analyses in Virginia, and the Asia Bureau of Defense News. He's the author of Hot Off the Press, a newly published book, The Final Struggle Inside China's Global Strategy. We'll talk about this book as well as his uh, 2017 book, the, China, the Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. Uh, Ian is, is, a, is an old Taiwan hand. Uh, he holds an MA in China Studies from National Zhengzhou University uh, in Taiwan. He holds a, a BA in International Studies from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign as well as having studied Chinese at uh, National Taiwan Normal University. Uh, so let's give a round of applause for Ian. Thank you for coming all the way out here to Seattle. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's, let's get started, shall we? Um, so uh, basically, the, the way this will go is we will have kind of a one-on-one -on -one discussion for about 40 minutes. Uh, then we will open it up to the audience as well as to our online audience on YouTube uh, for questions. Uh, but for now, I, I just have a, a series of questions which I'll ask Ian, and we'll just have a conversation. Okay. Um, so let's start with your 2017 book, um, The Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. Uh, one of the few, I would say one of the best books out there, one of the most thorough books, uh, lots of primary sources, Chinese language sources, looking at um, Taiwan's defense as well as the PLA, as well as what kind of Beijing would do in the case of some kind of military invasion. Um, would you mind summarizing for us some of the major points from the book? So the, the book had, I think, two major points. The, the first point is that Taiwan faces a real and growing threat of a potential attack from the People's Republic of China. And the second point was a little more hopeful, right? So the book described the threat. It described the things that the People's Liberation Army was doing to prepare for this particular scenario, described China's military buildup, and the history behind it, going back to the 1940s. What was driving this? Um, and then it talked about Taiwan's own defense. And what I found in the course of research was that actually Taiwan is defendable, and it's much more defensible than I think generally is believed. And so the book ends on kind of a, an optimistic note in the sense that if Taiwan makes the appropriate reforms to its uh, defense and security situation, and if the United States makes the appropriate reforms uh, and does more to have a much closer defense and security relationship with Taiwan, then we're likely to see uh, the preservation of peace for as far as the eye can see. And so that was kind of where the, the research concluded uh, in 2017. And of course, a lot has happened since then. Yeah, and that takes me right to my next question, which is, it's now 2022, uh, even though only five years has passed since the book was published, a lot of things have changed. So Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, the US commitment to Taiwan has grown steadily over the years. And Taiwan public opinion, it appears, is now changing with regards to uh, social perspectives about the military. What parts of, of the Chinese invasion threat might you update today? Um, and what do you think hasn't changed? Um, has anything surprised you in the past five years that maybe you weren't expecting? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there, there were three big surprises for me over the past five years or so, since the book came out. 
uh, the first surprise was that a lot of the things that PLA military strategists and military theorists talked about in their studies on what would be required for a future attack on Taiwan, a lot of those things were theoretical in the early, in the, in the 2000s and the early 2010s. And it was aspirational. Here were textbooks being issued to PLA officers making the argument that these are the things that we would need to do to, to get ready for an invasion of Taiwan. But th that's all very hard. What surprised me was the way in which they've been able to take aspirations, things that seemed unlikely to actually occur five years ago, and they've actually acted on them. That Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party has had the political will to do things that seemed almost unimaginable five years ago. Things like military civil fusion, you know, the mobilization of all Chinese society, the militarization of Chinese society, the massive investments that they've made into their military, and especially the reform and reorganization program uh, that started in 2016, and at the time, nobody knew how it would go, no one knew how far it would go, and it is remarkable uh, how far it's gone. And so a lot of the things that, that once seemed only theoretical, they seemed abstract, they seemed very unlikely to occur, have actually occurred over the past five years in a remarkable fashion. And so what we're watching is the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese government, mm -hmm. build up for an all-out invasion of Taiwan with a tremendous sense of urgency. That was a surprise to me. And the more I learn about things that are going on in China on the military and security front, the more concerned I, I've grown. And I think that's the case for a lot of people across the U.S. military, and the strategic studies community, uh, both in, in Washington and in Taiwan and in other capital cities around the world. It's really worrisome to see what, what Beijing is doing, the kind of investments they're making, and the kind of behavior that we're also seeing from, from the government there. The second thing that surprised me was how slow Taiwan was to reform its military. So in, in 2016, 2017, when the book came out, the, the um, President Tsai had been elected, and there was great hope that Taiwan could make significant leaps forward and do things that would make Taiwan much better positioned to defend against both an invasion and potential coercive campaigns like a blockade, for example. That has happened, to be sure. There have been significant reforms that have, have occurred but not nearly at the speed uh, and the pace that, that was anticipated, um, or certainly that I expected back in 2016, 2017. So re reforms of the reserve system, uh, at, just as one example, um, restructuring of, of units, making um, some of the, the national drills much more realistic, much more intense, that's all faced pushback uh, for political reasons, right? I mean, Taiwan is a country that has not experienced a 9-11 moment or a 3-11 moment if you're in Japan, right? The, the 3-11 triple disaster. Taiwan has enjoyed the blessings of peace since 1958. 1958 was the last time the Taiwanese military was in a battle at all during the second Taiwan Strait crisis. And naturally, in any peaceful democracy, you're going to have um, complacency seep in. And you're going to start, you know, if you grow up and all you know is this world, then you're naturally going to come to the belief that, that this world is normal, that peace is normal, and that, you, that there'll never be a war, because that's all you've ever known. Um, the third thing that surprised me was a, similar in Washington, a similar phenomenon, where in 2016, 2017, there were high hopes that the Trump administration at the time was gonna make significant improvements uh, in terms of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Of course, President Trump had a, a phone call with President Tsai Ing-wen, um, and there were high hopes that there could be significant breakthroughs. There was talk of, of U.S. Navy ships visiting Taiwan. There were talks of, of all kinds of things that, that were expected. None of that happened. None of that happened. Um, and so it was kind of a stagnation 
uh, in many regards for, for U.S.-Taiwan relations in the defense and security realm really until 2020. And then in 2020, there was a significant spike where, for a combination of reasons, um, the administration finally said, okay, <laughs> we're going to take the gloves off. We're no longer worried about diplomatic pressure from Beijing. Uh, anything Taiwan wants to buy, we will sell. And so it was just remarkable. It was arms sale after arms sale after arms sale. Um, it, was, it was just, I've never seen anything like it. I don't think it, anything like this has ever happened before, where, you know, Tecro in Washington, Taiwan's de facto embassy in Washington, year after year after year, would ask <laughs> for lists of different capabilities that the military needed. And time and time again, they would be rejected or it would be deferred or be tabled. In 2020, it was whatever you guys want, you've got it, um, and that was that was pretty remarkable. Um, but it's problematic when you have all your eggs in one basket, isn't it? When the entire foundation of U.S.-Taiwan defense and security relations is just arms sales, that's created a single point of failure. Um, when it should be much broader for any other democracy in peril whether it's South Korea, whether it's Israel, whether it's the Baltic states in Europe, you see a much more robust and resilient uh, defense and security relationship between the U.S. and those democratic partners and allies. We still, to this day, don't see that with Taiwan. Uh, and that makes Taiwan, I think, unnecessarily vulnerable to coercion and to a potential attack. Now, that is starting to change. Uh, of course, we all saw President Biden on 60 Minutes just a week ago come out and publicly say that he would order U.S. troops to, to defend Taiwan. That was a remarkable shift um, in, in U.S. policy. To hear a president of the United States say that, it was remarkable. So what I think we can expect now is that we know the commander's intent, we know the commander-in-chief's intent, and so now it falls to the Pentagon and to the State Department and other branches of the government to actually do the kinds of things that, that many folks uh, have long called for uh, but that were politically difficult to do. Um, so the aperture, I think, has been open, and we're probably likely to see a remarkable change uh, in the years ahead. Yeah. Do you see uh, President Biden's recent remarks in the 60 Minutes as actually a, a significant shift in U.S. policy? I think we've seen a couple times where, you know, supposedly some in the media have called it Biden's made a gaffe here and there. He's, he's said things that have run counter to longstanding U.S. policy. Right. Um, but it seems this is his third or fourth time he said it publicly, and it seems that this is no mistake, that he really does intend to say that the United States will send troops to defend Taiwan. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there are some State Department officials who say that you know, longstanding U.S. policy hasn't changed. So what, what kind of shift do you see in this, this kind of, perhaps, um, slightly ambiguous strategic ambiguity? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's a great way to phrase yeah. it, right? Um, I think it's a very significant change. Okay. I think the first three times the president said it, um, there was still room for, for some ambiguity, some doubt, right. uh, in terms of the way he said it, and then in terms of the U.S. government's uh, behavior, whether it was uh, denying Taiwan arms sales after the president said that, or whether it was um, you know, somebody in the administration leaked Speaker Pelosi's uh, intended visit to Taiwan. Uh, and there was apparently a campaign to try to discourage her from going to Taiwan. Uh, and so that created an impression that the White House may not have actually been that committed to, to Taiwan's defense. The fourth time, however, the one on 60 Minutes changed all that. Because in this case, it was premeditated. It was clear that, that they had um, worked this question in to the interview and that it was asked twice and that the way President Biden said it was, uh, it was crystal clear right. in a way that we've not seen before. And so what does that mean? It means that those, the, 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 you know, the State Department spokesperson or the White House spokesperson, they can honestly say that our one China policy has not changed. That is true. But they can no longer honestly say that we still have a policy of strategic ambiguity. And in fact, the U.S. government never had a, a policy of strategic ambiguity. That was a, a term that the media made up, um, that the U.S. government's policy was not. That, 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 that was, 
a term of art that was used, but um, what we now see is we have strategic clarity. The president, who is the policymaker, he's the one who, whose vote matters in this matter. He's the one that has to give the orders. He has said that he has every intention of sending U.S. forces to defend Taiwan if there's an, a Chinese invasion. That is new. Yeah. That's a remarkable shift. So we no longer have strategic ambiguity. We now have strategic clarity. But we do have ambiguity in terms of at the operational level and the tactical level. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. War, military's war plans necessarily are still ambiguous. Those are still secret. And nobody knows for sure when the U.S. would move and how they would move and, and you know, how this would all play out. Uh, we don't have troops in Taiwan, or maybe we have a small number of troops, very small. But it's not like South Korea, right, where we have tens of thousands of troops on the ground. Um, and so there's still that kind of operational tactical level ambiguity, but strategically now we know, now there's clarity. Now that we know uh, if China should make the terrible decision to, to attack Taiwan um, and to try to annihilate Taiwan's democratically elected government, that the U.S. military will, will be there to, uh, to help defend Taiwan. That's, um, I think that's of great reassurance to folks that have worked on this issue for a long time and that have been worried that the strategic picture was starting to unravel. Let's go back to um, one of the points you mentioned to the earlier question about changes in Taiwan. So it seems that recent polls in the past couple of years have shown that Taiwan's public opinion, which has long been kind of skeptical, um, as you say, perhaps even complacent, um, about the importance of the military and the military's institution, has perhaps begun to change. So for example, uh, Taiwan's conscription system, which, is, which was originally set to be reduced, might reverse course. They might kind of roll back some of those changes. Uh, what is the relationship, uh, in your perspective, to, between Taiwan society and Taiwan's military? Well, it's a very, uh, it's a very close relationship, uh, simply because all of the men in, in Taiwan have national service. Um, there still is conscription, it's just no longer a year or 12 months. It used to be two years, mandatory military service. Now it's four months. Yeah. Um, that's really what has changed. And that can be divided, of course, into two summers. You know, you could do two months one summer, two months another summer. Um, so it's basically just boot camp. And of course, there's a lot of alternative service options that have become available. As the military has downsided, they no longer have enough jobs in the military, even in boot camp. They don't have enough trainers uh, to process every, every, every guy in Taiwan who's of military age. And so there's a lot of alternative service. You could be a firefighter. You could go teach at a rural school. You could help the police. Uh, I mean, there, there's, you could even work at a 7-Eleven. Um, there's a lot of different alternative national service jobs that are available now. Um, the reason it matters so much, and, and the reason I think folks in Taiwan that are calling for reforms along these lines, uh, I personally agree with the idea of reforming Taiwan's uh, reserve system mm -hmm. and having longer conscription, because in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, or even in, in the event of a, a long blockade, the Taiwanese government will need to mobilize all of society. Everybody will be in it, everybody will be trapped, um, and people will have to fight for the survival of, of their country. And that means that you want to have people that are trained and that have the necessary education so they don't feel hopeless. Because the, the worst possible situation you can get into is you have a catastrophe the likes of which no one has ever lived through before, no one's ever seen anything like it. and and people don't know what to do. And, and they feel helpless. Even if they want to help the nation, they want to do something to defend themselves, their family, their community, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to help. That would be a very bad situation to be in. And so I think that's why it's so important for some of the initiatives that right now are being discussed. Uh, I think it would be great for those to go forward. And I think there's a lot that the Pentagon and the US military can do to help that process along. We used to have what was called 
the Military Assistance Advisory Group in Taiwan from 1950, 1951 until 1979, where you would have thousands of American trainers rotate through Taiwan and help the Taiwanese military uh, and you know, share, share all the latest in terms of, of military knowledge and professional military education. We have not had that because of the sort of restrictive nature of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Um, I think that could be brought back now. I think th there's now perhaps the political will in Washington and the recognition of the threat being as severe as it's become, that perhaps we could, we could bring programs like that back um, and have American trainers. Because again, I mean, Taiwan's military happily, fortunately, has not been in a fight since 1958. So nobody serving today has ever been in a fight. Of course, that's not the case for the U.S. military. The U.S. military has a lot of combat experience. And so there are a lot of lessons learned that U.S. trainers uh, and advisors and liaison officers could, could share. What effects do you see the current Russia-Ukraine war having upon Taiwan's defense and a potential future military scenario uh, in the Taiwan Strait? Uh, well, I mean, there's both uh, polling data that suggests this and, and then also just, you know, following the media and, and just the general sense around the world that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has, has served as a wake-up call. It's been a shocking, that was what happened on February 24th of this year was a shock. That prior to February 24th, most people thought the idea of interstate warfare, one country invading a smaller neighbor, that we all knew that happened historically a lot throughout the history of, of you know, the human story, the civilization. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, it seemed taboo. It almost seemed unthinkable that, that we were now in the 21st century going to live in the world where countries invade each other like that. Yeah. Um, and so most people didn't believe it, even when the Russians mobilized their military and were making very aggressive moves. And even, of course, after the 2014, you know, little green men, you know, and the, what happened in the Donbass region. It still seemed very unlikely to most people that Putin would order an all-out invasion of Ukraine. But then it happened. And once it happened, it broke through that mental barrier, I think, that everybody had. And immediately it focused attention around the world on what could happen to Taiwan. And so there was, you know, folks started to think, you know, today Ukraine, tomorrow Taiwan. And polling data suggests that that was not only the case in the U.S. and around the world, but also in Taiwan, that across Taiwan, watching on the nightly news night after night, the war in Ukraine instantly brought into people's imaginations a scene that they had never really believed was possible before because they started to think, this could be my town, this could be my city, this could be my country uh, in, the, in the future that, that I'll live in you know, in the foreseeable future. Um, this is no longer a, a problem for the next generation to worry about or the generation after that. Um, and we can no longer kick the can. And so there has been a remarkable shift in public opinion, according to polling data, in terms of willingness to fight, willingness to serve the nation, willingness to reconsider um, political issues like conscription, bringing back a year-long mandatory national conscription, so taking that four months of training and turning it into a 12-month training period and making the training far more intensive uh, than it currently is and it certainly has been in recent years. That used to be the third rail of Taiwanese politics. I remember being in the LY, Taiwan's parliament, and talking to um, parliamentarians and, and asking about this issue in the past, and they would say, yes, we, we think, those of us on the Defense and, and Foreign Affairs Committee, we think we should have more conscription time. We think we should have more uh, intensive training and more civil defense uh, type of, uh, of education. But the Taiwanese public would never stand it for it. And they would, I would be run out of office. I would never get elected on that platform. Um, it was the third rail. You touch it and you die, right? 
Now, it's, there's been a remarkable shift. <clears throat> now I think there's public pressure from Taiwanese society on the government to start to do uh, these kinds of things that used to be very unpalatable. Now there's a lot of pressure from civil society in Taiwan for the military to, to do uh, a lot of these types of things and for society more broadly. I mean, we've seen uh, wealthy philanthropists now donating money for a military training and defense training and disaster training. Uh, that is, you know, things like the Kuma Academy um, or Kuma Academies uh, and Forward Alliance that uh, Enoch Wu and, and others are involved in, that, that's a remarkable shift. Just a few years ago, that would have been um, hard to imagine. Yeah, I have to think um, for many of the, the philanthropists which have been in the news recently for their, their kinds of contributions, in past years probably would have been maybe reluctant to make just because many of them have business ties with China. And so these are the kinds of public moves that would have certain kinds of reactions perhaps to their businesses. Um, I also recall recently I heard on an interview with uh, Chris Horton, who often writes for the New York Times about Taiwan, that informally in his conversations with average Taiwanese, I think he, he talked to someone who does um, normally does uh, surgery on a surgeon who does surgery on the pancreas has taken up an interest in trauma surgery because mm -hmm. of a fear that in an upcoming military scenario might need to be able to perform surgery on gunshot wounds. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of informal things I've, I've been seeing as well. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I want to talk about your, your new book. So you've recently published this book, uh, The Final Struggle Inside China's Global Strategy. Um, how does Taiwan figure into into China's strategy. Uh, what does this mean for the future of Taiwan? Feel free to share some of the other points from your from your new book as well. So, so the book is is not primarily about Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, the book is about the Chinese Communist Party's global strategy, and in particular, uh, its strategy to achieve to become the supreme superpower of of the world. Uh, and that was one of the things that really struck me in the course of research. Is when I began. I began not with a thesis or even a hypothesis, I began with questions. And one of the questions was, does Beijing have a long-term strategy? And if so, what are their objectives? How do they articulate it? And how are they attempting to bring that vision into, you know, into reality? And after about three years of, of research and watching a lot of Xi Jinping speeches and reading uh, transcripts of them and, and reading his books and then reading the planning documents that come out of the various ministries uh, and even the textbooks that they assign students at the Central Party School uh, and then all the way down because of course now we're, we're looking at Xi Jinping thought at the last party Congress was enshrined into the Constitution and uh, all the way down to elementary schools where children across China and now Hong Kong have to learn what is Xi Jinping thought and so my question became, okay, well, what does Xi Jinping thought have to say about these types of issues? Uh, and the term of art that I kept coming across was creating or constructing a community of common destiny for all mankind. So what does that mean? I wondered. Um, and so I, I kept digging and digging and digging. And what it means is Xi Jinping has a vision in which China becomes the world superpower and China dominates the world across every spectrum, politically, economically, technologically, uh, militarily, and that the United States and other democracies are, get thrown into the dustbin of history. Uh, that I found to be rather worrisome and rather surprising, that, that combination of, of deep insecurity that exists in the Chinese Communist Party, fear of your own people, in this case, fear of, of, of um, movements for democracy in China and the need for massive surveillance and repression. And of course, we've seen this play out, uh, especially over the past five years. But of course, it started uh, under Xi Jinping's predecessor, Hu Jintao, but it's just accelerated. And that combined with, with almost limitless ambition. This, this ideological belief that 
they can create a new world order, that Xi Jinping himself and the Chinese Communist Party can create a new world order, and then they can beat democracy. They can beat free market capitalism, and they can achieve what they do refer to as a new world order. And this would be a, a, an authoritarian world. This would be a totalitarian world, uh, according to Xi Jinping. It would be what he refers to as world socialism or international communism. That, for me, was really stunning. And so what does this mean for democracies like Taiwan? It means Taiwan is in the crosshairs. And Taiwan is target number one. Because Taiwan's remarkable transition from a one-party militaristic dictatorship into now the world's most successful, certainly Asia's most successful democratic uh, government, and of course, you know, I think there was a multiple reports this year found that Taiwan is now uh, in the top 10, among the top 10 most liberal su successful democratic countries in the world. I mean, it's just a remarkable uh, transition that Taiwan has made. And it's done it while maintaining uh, high levels of economic growth. Taiwan has been very prosperous and it has a very a vibrant civil society and very stable society. Anybody who's been to Taiwan knows that Taiwan is the safest or the second safest country in the world in terms of violent crime. I think Japan might be number one. Taiwan's a close second. It's extremely safe. Violent crime is very, very rare uh, in Taiwan. All of that calls into question the PRC line because the Chinese Communist Party for decades has been telling the world that democracy is not compatible with Chinese culture and that democracy won't work for Chinese people, that it's just not compatible and that, that the, the supreme method of governance, the, the only good method of governance uh, is what they have in China, which of course is a one-party dictatorship. Um, and Taiwan, of course, calls that, that narrative uh, into question. It, it proves it to be a myth, uh, and it busts that myth. And every election that goes, uh, you know, that occurs in Taiwan, and every day that Taiwan continues to exist as a country, uh, calls into question the founding, the founding line of, of the Chinese Communist Party. And so Taiwan is, is certainly target number one. It matters a great deal for Beijing in terms of legitimacy, the legitimacy of the party. It also matters a great deal for its economic prowess and its technological prowess and its strategic location. Uh, it matters for all of those reasons as well. And so if Taiwan were to be attacked and if Taiwan were to lose and actually be taken over, annexed, conquered, absorb, you know, pick your term of art for it, but it would be a very ugly thing. If that were to occur, that would open up a tremendous strategic opportunity for Beijing uh, on a number of different levels. And it would help China achieve all of its other goals in terms of undermining U.S. alliances, taking over the future of the internet and the future of, of high technology, uh, being able to punch through the first island chain, which is the, the islands that run from, from Hokkaido, Japan, all the way down through the Philippines and then curves around to Indonesia and Singapore. Right now, all of those islands, um, you have U.S. troops or you have countries that are friendly to the United States. Um, Taiwan sits right at the middle of that. And so if China could seize that key strategic territory, uh, that would fundamentally change the security architecture in Asia. And so this is why, it, these are some of the reasons, and there, and there are many, many reasons uh, why Taiwan matters so much for Xi Jinping uh, and also so much for the party. What can Taiwan do to counter uh, gray zone warfare? So for example, this could include cyber attacks, uh, seizure of outlying islands, uh, parcel blockade, um, pressure on Taiwan citizens who are residing in China, of which there are a number, um, or other moves that are short of what we might consider to be full-scale warfare um, that could undermine uh, Taiwan's economy. Are we placing too much emphasis on a scenario of all-out warfare as opposed to maybe these other kinds of scenarios? 
Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we, we don't have the luxury in, in the United States or in Taiwan of thinking of this as a binary. It's, it's not like a light switch that you can switch on and off. The lights are either on or they're off, right? And that's kind of how we think of war and peace uh, in the United States, and I think in Taiwan as well. Um, in the minds of strategists in China, it's like a dimmer switch, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be very dark, and then there are shades of gray, mm -hmm. and then it can be very bright, and, and, the, and they can accentuate, uh, they can turn it up, they can turn it down, depending on what the political directives and requirements are at, at that moment. Um, and so for, for Beijing, what we're likely to see is a very long period of coercion. It's a war of nerves that goes on. You know, the war of the mind always happens before, or the battle of the mind happens before the battle of the fist, right? And this is what we're now seeing. We're seeing this long-term campaign of coercion because, of course, Beijing's preference would be to destroy Taiwan's democracy with minimal use of military force. Because if they actually had to invade and occupy Taiwan, that would be, there'd be a high likelihood of failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, amphibious assaults are by far the most difficult military operation uh, that you can imagine, and they've only gotten more difficult in view of uh, modern precision strike uh, architecture where you have satellites, you have very high fidelity radars, you have drones, you can see the battle space like never before in real time or near real time, and then you can target missiles from very, very long ranges that can go out and hit slow moving ships, which are, you know, big slow targets. Um, and that makes the idea of an invasion very, very difficult for, for the PLA. And the, the, the kinds of risks that they would have to run with their military to actually pull it off, especially if the U.S. is helping defend Taiwan, and that means our allies are also there with us, when you look at it from the, a war planner's perspective in, in Beijing or in Nanjing, um, Nanjing is where they're, the, that's where the, the, the key studies go on, um, and that's, that's the, the headquarters for the Eastern Theater Command. That is, um, it's, a, it's a daunting challenge. You have to have a hundred different things go right for you because you're facing a, a, a defensive adversary who has a layer of defense, and they can stop you at, at any point along the way, and you've got to be able to chop through all that. Um, and then you've got to occupy a hostile terrain that is very, very difficult to occupy. I mean, Taiwan's very, very mountainous. The highest mountain range in, in all of uh, East Asia is not in Japan, it's not in the Philippines, it's not even in Eastern China, it's in Taiwan. Uh, you're, you're talking about something like 200, 250 mountain peaks in Taiwan that are um, over 3,000 meters in elevation. Uh, you're talking about very dense urban terrain, which gives the a defender tremendous advantages. You're talking about very small beaches um, that can be easily turned into, you know, nightmarish <laughs> uh, scenes yeah. with mines and fire obstacles and all kinds of other things of that nature. Um, and you're talking about a, a very limited number of ports that can be seized because ports would be critical for, for an invasion operation. You have to be able to seize uh, not only a beach, uh, but also a port facility uh, and an airport as well. It's, it's that you need that trifecta to be able to flow in enough forces to have predominance. You would need a five to one advantage uh, for the attacker to win at least. And all of that is very, very, it's made difficult by, again, the fact that Taiwan does have a fairly large ground force and um, very favorable terrain. Um, so this is, I think, why the Chinese military is engaged in such a massive military buildup, and they're doing it with such great levels of urgency. Um, and so I think their preference would certainly be to subvert Taiwan's government, to bring Taiwan down from within, and to use coercion to do it, uh, the way they did with Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong fell without a fight. I mean, there were protests, but there was really no fight. Uh, and they were able to insert their preferred political candidates to use law, because of course people in Hong Kong respect law, very law-abiding citizens, and had this national security law, then a draconian crackdown, you did decapitate uh, potential resistance. 
uh, and then any kind of freedom falls and resistance falters. Um, and so I think there's a very significant need now for the U.S. and Taiwan not just to focus on the invasion scenario, not just to focus on what happens when everything goes black, you know, when that dimmer switch <laughs> hits rock bottom, um, but also to think about how do you deal with the gradients along the way as it gets darker and darker and darker, um, and at what point do you make big political moves so that you can push it and add some more brightness to the picture. And I think this is something that President Biden, my, my best guess is, the reason he's moved towards strategic clarity is because he has been getting a lot of intelligence reports that are suggesting the picture is getting darker and darker and darker, and we could actually have a war on our hands um, in the foreseeable future, the next two to five years, if we don't do something. Um, and so he's, he's moved towards strategic clarity. And I think that's going to add some, some brightness to the picture. And now there's going to be this, again, it's a war of nerves, right? Um, and ultimately, the target is not only the, the voters, but it's the political leaders themselves. Because if the President of the United States decides he's not going to be coerced and intimidated, and if the President of Taiwan decides she's not going to be coerced and intimidated, nothing else Beijing can do is going to make a difference. And then that forces them into a very difficult situation. Um, and that makes the preservation of peace much more likely, even if there is, which is likely, I, I think, to happen, even if there's a long period of crisis and tensions. Uh, and there could be multiple crises that we see in the years ahead, in the same way that we saw that in Berlin during the Cold War, from the late 1940s all the way until the 60s. It was just seemed like one dang crisis after the next. But because the U.S. government showed resolve uh, and we worked with our allies and partners, we were able to preserve the peace. And so I think some of those, um, some of that playbook can be brought back and some of, those, some of that deterrence toolkit can be brought back so that we convince uh, even somebody like Xi Jinping, who's hard to, hard to talk to, right? And it's hard to, to get through to a guy like that because he is a dictator and he is surrounded by sycophantic advisors in the same way Putin is. And so he's going to have a distorted view of the world because no one's going to tell that man anything he doesn't want to hear. Um, but maybe the president of the United States can. Um, and maybe that'll help preserve the peace. I think that's much more likely now. Um, you know, if you ask me today the probability, nobody can predict the future, nobody can see the future. It's, it's a numbers game. It's, you know, it's people talk about it's the gamble and probabilities, I think the probability of war has gone significantly down over the, even the past two weeks. If I swore we were two weeks ago, uh, most people that I spoke to uh, thought it was greater than 50 percent. And when you think about the magnitude of what that would mean in this particular scenario, that is it's chilling. It's deeply troubling uh, to think that it could be greater than 50 percent of, 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 of a war because as terrible and tragic as what we're seeing in Ukraine today, a war in the Taiwan Strait would be exponentially more devastating across every level and for countries around the world. It could lead to a Great Depression. Um, and and I, don't, I don't mean that um, in an alarmist fashion or, or um, I don't mean to be uh, hyperbolic at all. That's true, that, that studies have been going on in Washington about the economic impacts of a potential Chinese attack on Taiwan, Taiwan sits right at the center, it's the heart of the global high-tech uh, economy. It's, it's really the, the heart of it because something like 99, that's well over 90 percent, close to 99 percent of the most advanced chips uh, in the world come from Taiwan uh, and from Taiwanese companies. Um, and, and that is just one area where Taiwan plays this critical role in the, the technology ecosystem that we all benefit from. Um, and so the idea of an actual kinetic fight 
in the Taiwan Strait is is something that that is so troubling that I think um, we have to start talking about it. And 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 it's reassuring to me to hear the president, our president, uh, openly talking about it. Um, and your question, you, you asked about what can Taiwan's government do in the face of coercion. I think one of the things that, that we've seen um, them do quite well, and especially the Ministry of National Defense, is be more transparent. Be more transparent. And so we've seen uh, MND start to release a lot more information about um, Chinese air incursions. And now we're starting to see a release of information about naval incursions. Mm. Previously, all that information was classified in Taiwan. It was not being made available to the public. And so people in the military in Taiwan knew the kind of pressure they were under. They knew how dangerous mm -hmm. the situation was. And if you talk to fighter pilots in Taiwan, they knew they were exhausted because they had to scramble all the time and they had to be on strip alert where they're sitting there at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., ready to jump in their fighter jet and take off at any moment. But people in Taiwan didn't know that. You know, the average person didn't know that. And the same with the sailors that are out there on patrol in the Taiwan Strait. They knew how often their ships were being called on to sortie and to scramble out of the ports. But people, didn't, people in Taiwan didn't know that. People in the international community didn't know that. Now they do. Now more and more of that information is being made public. And we've seen a previous example uh, in the case of the government of Japan uh, after 2012, 2013, when there was a significant campaign of coercion that went on uh, over the Senkaku Diaoyutai mm -hmm. Islands mm -hmm. in that area where the Japanese self-defense uh, force started to release more and more information and even images of the Chinese drones and aircraft and ships that they were having to deal with. Um, that had a very helpful effect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's healthy um, to be more transparent about that. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the solutions to coercion is, is a willingness to be more transparent about what's going on and to tell your people and to tell the world, here's what's going on. Because coercion works best in an environment of fear where people don't know. It works very well in the shadows doesn't work as well in the light of day because once you shine a light on it it looks well it looks bad you know people can see what it is and people can start to judge people it's like a bully on a playground you know if a kid's getting bullied on the playground and he doesn't tell his teachers and nobody can see it it's happening you know behind some play equipment and he's getting beat up or he's getting threatened and nobody knows about it well the bully has no cost. He incurs no cost at all. If he, it's being reported, if it's being videotaped, if it's known, then the entire school administration can react. Um, and it's the same with countries that face coercion. And so I think this is one of the things that we're starting to see is countries around the world are starting to see the Chinese Communist Party's behavior. They're starting to see Xi Jinping's behavior and they're starting to judge and they're starting to change their policies accordingly. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the ways, and there are other ways as well. You know, obviously there's a lot more the U.S. could do to show support and solidarity to Taiwan. I mean, for example, we could see a presidential phone call. Or maybe President Biden already speaks to President Tsai on the phone or via video conference, and they have just not made that public. Maybe they will. You know, maybe we'll come to a place where, where these types of things that were previously being withheld out of deference to Beijing sensitivities will no longer be withheld um, because there's a real concern that um, continuing to withhold this kind of information could be destabilizing. It could actually play into the hands of, 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 uh, of the PLA. Okay. Um I just want to mention that uh, what Ian has described in terms of kind of the, the defense scenario is, is spelled out quite clearly and very cogently in his 2017 book. So I encourage, if you're interested in learning more, there are fantastic maps about geography. Um, Ian goes into climates and you know, kind of what time of the year. It's, it's just a really well-researched book. So 
uh, if you want to learn more about this, take, check out his, I haven't read the new book, but check out his 2017 book, which is excellent on this. Um, one final question, uh, and I want to make sure that we leave time for our audience. Uh, this final question, you've already mentioned some suggestions, but maybe to, to wrap <laughs> things up quickly, um, what are your, your, your big picture suggestions to, to both Taiwanese people, Taiwan society, Taiwan policymakers, as well as to to Americans and American policymakers. No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't know that I'm even close to being qualified to make any kind of big uh, recommendations. Um, I I do think transparency is a good thing, uh, and I, I think it's very positive that we're starting to see more transparency, um, both in Washington and in Taiwan, more of a conversation about what's really going on and what that means and how that can inform our future policies. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly hope that this will lead to an outpouring of, of intellectual capital, uh, it, certainly in the security studies realm and the political studies realm, that there'll be much more work done looking at some of these issues because there has been a deficit. You know, there are still so many questions that are unanswered. There's so much that we don't know about what goes on in, in Chinese politics and in the halls of power in Beijing, and so much we don't know about 21st century deterrence. You know, in the early days of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, there was this outpouring of, of, of intellectual capital. Uh, and you had these brilliant American uh, strategists study, how are we gonna keep the peace? We, you know, this is a generation that had just come out of World War II Many of them fought in World War II and they had nightmares about it at night, about what they had seen, and they never wanted to fight World War III. And so there was this tremendous growth in the deterrence community. And deterrence is just a, a Pentagon word for peace preservation. How do you preserve peace in, in, in an age of, of superpower in that twilight struggle, uh, in a Cold War? How do you make sure it never turns hot? I think we now need a new blossoming intellectually and we need new theories for how is deterrence going to work in the 21st century and how will it apply to the US PRC strategic competition, the new Cold War, and especially with Taiwan. Because it is so hard to deter an attack on a country that is diplomatically not treated as a country by the U.S. State Department and by other uh, foreign ministries and state departments around the world. That is very, very hard. That's, we've never had this kind of foreign policy challenge before. How do you, what does that mean for deterrence? How do you defend a country that you can't officially treat as a country? And if you can't, and if the results could be war, well then maybe you should start to treat it more like a country, right? And so how does that inform your your diplomacy and your foreign policy, but how do you move in that direction without doing something that gives Beijing an excuse, maybe, to do to be more provocative or to do something maybe they want to do anyways? Um, these are the very difficult challenges, and we don't have a good theory for how deterrence works in this kind of environment, and we especially don't have a good sense. At least my impression is we don't have a good sense of. How do, you, how do you have a Cold War with a country that in a, in a globalized, integrated world where so many jobs are dependent in the United States on the Chinese market? And when you have such close ties between China and the United States across the spectrum in terms of education, and technology and data flows and I mean you name it trade and economics and agriculture I mean you know name your sphere and yet you might go to war with each other that is a mind-boggling problem the likes of which we've never had before and it's even more mind-boggling when you think about the repercussions um, of the second and third order effects. So like, like what you've seen with Ukraine and how that has had uh, effects that were not anticipated in advance and that has, ha has had shocks.
to supply chains and to the global um, security environment that were just not anticipated. Uh, in part because nobody thought that such a war was actually going to happen. Um, and so now I think there's a lot of hard work to do in, the, in, this, uh, in this area. And it used to be very, very hard to do it because people didn't want to talk about it. It was something Congressman Randy Forbes called the Voldemort effect. Mm. Um, it was so dark and so scary, people didn't want to talk about it. Mm. It was not polite to talk about Taiwan defense and security issues in public. Just a few years ago, when I wrote the book, it certainly was not. Um, now we're in a situation where we really need to. We need to have an open discourse and debates and discussions on these types of issues precisely to make sure that, that, that we get it right and that we can preserve the peace. All right. Thank you, Ian. Um, I want to open it up to our audience members to take questions. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online as well, we will be able to uh, see and read off your questions from the YouTube comments. Uh, so questions, please, for Ian. Yes. Um, what would the start, if there was supposed to be, if there was a war, what would it look like if it got started, like on the ground, what would it look like? On the grounds of Taiwan or Taipei? I'll just repeat the question for our um, online audience members. So if there were a war, what would it kind of look like on the ground? How would it start? Yeah. Um, it, in the event of an all-out invasion, the way it would probably look, and again, nothing like this has ever happened before. So there's a certain degree of, of imagination and, and you know, it's, at a certain level, it's speculative. But if you look at uh, Chinese doctrinal studies and their military technical studies uh, and, and the way they train their officers on what they need to prepare for, um, what you would likely see is an attempt to destroy Taiwan's leadership right out of the gates, to assassinate Taiwan's president uh, and to, to have a situation where Taiwan could not have continuity of government and continuity of operations. Uh, because without, you know, no matter how strong your, your body might be and how muscular you might be, if, you, <laughs> if somebody paralyzes you from the neck down, you, you're, help, you're helpless, right? And it's the same for the PLA. When they talk about an invasion of Taiwan, one of their first tasks will be to paralyze Taiwan in that way. Now that's a very hard thing to do, especially because Taiwan has good continuity of government. And so if that fails, uh, and what would that look like? That could be, that'd be special operations, it'd be covert uh, actions. So like what would it look like on the streets, like for every day on the streets of Taipei, for example? Well, you would see a lot of missiles, you'd see a lot of fire. Um, a lot of buildings would, would be on fire. Um, people would evacuate the main, main targets and you would see the military everywhere. Right now, the military is hidden in Taiwan. Most military bases in Taiwan, you can drive all around Taiwan, and I've done it. And you, you normally you don't see the military bases. They're all very well camouflaged behind, you know, giant shrubbery and buildings and, and high fences, and you don't see it. You don't see the, the hundreds and hundreds of tanks that are there just beyond the wall or in a garage uh, or in a warehouse. You don't see all the artillery. You don't see any of that stuff you would see it. You would see military everywhere. You'd see police everywhere. Um, you would s start to see all kinds of things that, that normally you would never see in peacetime. Um, but, but again, if the Chinese were attacking and firing missiles into Taiwan and, and firing attack drones into Taiwan, uh, it, it would be kind of a night nightmare scene, right? Um, and so that's probably how it would start. You might have blackouts. The power might go off. Water might go out. Gas might go out. So, so you're saying there's a lot of hidden tanks in like the, these military bases? Because I've, I've seen a lot of these military bases. So you have hidden tanks? Yeah, you have about a thousand tanks in Taiwan, large ones. And then thousands of, of other um, armored vehicles. Um, but you don't see them. You don't see them from the street, right? You can go right by them. Um, and it's same with their fighter jets. You know, Taiwan has the largest, one of the largest air forces in, in East Asia, but you don't see it because a lot of them are underground or they're in hardened aircraft shelters. Um, they're behind very high walls that are around the bases themselves. Um, and so Taiwan 
actually has a, a much larger military than most people realize. They don't see it day to day. And even in, in, you know, in downtown Taipei, there are military units that are invisible to the naked eye until, until mobilization happens and they have to go to a, a higher state of readiness. And so it would be a terrible scene. Um, and you know, it'd be something that, that we never want to have to actually see because the, the, the country's life would be at stake. And that means you'd have to mobilize and you might have to have martial law and you would have to have an environment that would, that would be very, uh, very stressful. Yes, please. Thank you, yeah. My name is Dan Huang. You use the coercions for more than 10 times. I think this is a very important strategy to the field. I think that Chinese have been using the coercion to try to use the military, military power to attack Taiwan for 70 years. Anyway, your coercion remind me a proposal that uh, suggested by the Hudson Institute at this time, the, the Hudson Institute, uh, one of the important American think tanks, was in yeah. Indiana, not Indiana, because uh, Deng Kuei was the vice president. But uh, now the Hudson Institute probably moved back to Washington, D.C. Or anyway, 30 years ago, there was a proposal. It's a coercion proposal. <laughs> they say if China dare to attack Taiwan, and Taiwan or United States should dare to attack their gold dam. The Changjiang Sanxia, we should make that clear, the coercion clear. If you dare to attack Taiwan, and we should dare to attack there for them to kill more people. What well, I assume Chinese, they, they are not there to initiate the war. Because you know, 40 years ago, the China, they induced a one-child policy. Many grandchildren, many children, they have one, one son at home. I bet they are not there to, to, to really start a war. But anyway, they use a coercion. We should use the similar coercion by attacking their Changjiang Sanxia. That was a proposal from Hutt Institute, proposed about 30 years ago. Thank you. Uh, so maybe the, the question is, would, would the United States consider you know, perhaps um, maybe taking a more offensive position as a form of deterrence. Is that, is that something that you see as a possibility or? Well, not, ne not necessarily offense. I think the defense, if they dare to do it, and we try to do it here, yeah, it's not offense. Suppose we want the defense policy, strategy. I see, okay. I, I think targeting is a very important uh, topic that deserves to be discussed more. I don't think it's legitimate to target civilians. Not civilians, we, them, yeah. But, but the, the Three Gorges Dam, yeah. uh, what that, that would be the effect of, of nuclear attacks on, on Chinese civilians. Because if that dam were to break, there are so many millions of, of innocent people that live downstream, uh, men, women, and children, that would drown. Um, it, it would be worse or, or maybe as bad as, as dropping a hydrogen bomb on a city. Um, and so uh, I am familiar w with the, 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 these kind of, of threats. I think what we're more likely to see from uh, U.S. government and, and Taiwanese planners when they think of, of targeting is focusing on the Chinese Communist Party's real weak point. And this real weak point is not the people of China because this is a dictatorship. This is a regime that the U.S. State Department has said is committing genocide. So this is a genocidal regime. This is a regime that, that cares very little about the welfare of the individual Chinese citizen, right? This terrible repression, massive violations of human rights go on every day in, in China, unfortunately, because of the nature of the government. And so I am not convinced that by threatening a lot of you know, millions and millions of Chinese individual lives that you could get Beijing to change their calculus. I do think, however, that you could have a counter coercion campaign where you threaten things that the Chinese Communist Party leadership 
holds uh, very valuable, including their own lives and their own grip on power and their own, maybe their, it could be their money, it could be a, a number of things that they hold very valuable. It could be the legitimacy of their, their rule. So you might see other schemes uh, for counter coercion that involves actually targeting and leadership. So, for example, um, I have heard a former, and anybody can watch this. this. I didn't have special access to this. This was during testimony at the, the Legislative UN, Taiwan's parliament, where you had a, a, a minister, the defense minister in Taiwan said, if China attempts to kill our president, we're going to go after the chairman of the CCP. So if Xi Jinping tries to kill Tsai Ing-wen, we're going we're gonna to try to kill Xi Jinping, right? That's counter coercion, right? And that's reciprocal. And it is, um, it's, it's of, of, this is something that I think would be more consistent with international law and with American and Taiwanese principles and values um, that, you know, you go after the guilty parties, you don't go after other parties in order to try to affect the decision making of the guilty party. Um, of course, we did that in World War II. You know, the U.S. Strat strategy, um, course of bombing campaigns that we engaged in. But I think there was a sense that a lot of people had afterwards that it left a stain on the, kind of the soul of America. You know, the idea that you're burning so many innocent people. And that's something that, that uh, you know, was a legacy of the Cold War as well. A lot of the war plans that went on involved um, these kind of campaigns. And that's something that I hope I hope we can avoid. So when we do improve, I hope that in the 21st century we can develop better forms of, of coercion, counter coercion, uh, and methods of, of dealing with strategic competition, better methods than we had in the past. Methods that target the decision makers themselves, uh, or at least military targets, what we consider legitimate targets under international law, and not the people of China. Because the people of China are not, they've, they've done nothing wrong. They're the ones that are being repressed by their government. They're the, they're the first victims, right? Um, they're not the perpetrators of, of so is that what the proposal you know. About happened? Yeah. It's a coercion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I want to take a question from online. Um, Professor Gunther Schmidgens, who's actually our chair of our Baltic Studies program here at the UW, has asked a question uh, following up on what you said about the U.S. government treating Taiwan as a country. Can you comment on Taiwan's emerging official relationship with Lithuania? And I might even kind of expand on Professor Smitchin's question to, to expand it more broadly about, um, you know, what can the United States do to encourage other kind of Taiwan-leaning allies to maybe take up some of this um, responsibility or, or take up some of this, this along with the United States? So hopefully you can answer both of those questions. Well, first of all, I think Lithuania has done a wonderful job in this regard. Um, others have as well. The Czech Republic is another example of a small democracy that has ex an experience of dealing with communism and being the victim of a communist regime and of communist occupation. They know how terrible that is. They face coercion from Russia today. And it's great to see them stand up for democracy, a fellow democracy uh, in threat and in peril, and to start to do some of the things that they've done in the face of coercion from Russia and, and also from Beijing is, I think it's courageous, it's remarkable, and I think it's an example to so many other countries around the world, uh, including big democracies, uh, including our own. If little Lithuania can do the kinds of things that they've done, why can't the United States of America? And so your question was, what can Washington do? I mean, it's obvious. We can set an example. We can have cabinet level officials start to visit Taiwan. So far that has not happened uh, in the current administration. Maybe we could start to see cabinet level officials go to Taiwan. Maybe we could start to see generals and admirals visit Taiwan. Maybe we, should, we could see um, 
civilian officials at the deputy secretary, excuse me, the assistant, um, right now it's, we have not seen a deputy assistant secretary of defense or state go to Taiwan. We could see that potentially, then we could see assistant secretaries go, then maybe we could see undersecretaries go, right, and, and work our way up. Maybe we could see uh, President Biden have a phone call with President Tsai or, or even tweet back and forth. I mean, there's a whole range of things that the United States could do to show solidarity and support to Taiwan's government that we have not seen yet, but I think that, that um, we, we can and should see in, in the years ahead. Great. Uh, Professor David Bachman had a question. Yes, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess I want to ask your perspective as a longtime D.C. resident about the, the permanency of the U.S. position today in the sense that Stephen Wertheim came out with an op-ed saying that uh, Biden's commitment to Taiwan was a mistake. We see the progressive action in the Democratic Party likely to increase and in not wanting to use a U.S. military power abroad. <coughs> we have that, that, that interview that Josh Rogan did with Trump where Trump promised that he asked Xi Jinping whether uh, he would invade Taiwan and she promised to Trump that he wouldn't invade Taiwan. Uh, and so Trump took his word for it, according to Trump. So uh, right now, in light of Ukraine, there seems to be very solid bipartisan support for Taiwan. But do you have a sense that this will wax and wane, or is this a permanent change in the mindset? You know, one of the things that's so fun about living and working in the D.C. area is that American foreign policy is always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And it's a debate that never ends. It's always changeable. It's never static. Uh, and so you never know what is coming just around the bend. And you're always at least a little surprised by decisions that get made. And some, in some cases, you're very surprised by decisions that get made. And sometimes you're happily surprised, sometimes not so much. Um, and so I think that that's how I would answer the question is, that we could certainly be surprised. It's definitely not written in stone. There's no stone tablets that say, thou shall not do this or that with Taiwan, or thou shall do this or that. We don't know what the future will bring. Uh, all we can say is right now there is, I think, a remarkable debate that's going on. And it's a very dynamic um, intellectual environment right now my hope is that the results of that will be improvements and reforms. But to your, to your points, it is possible, depending on you know, the way politics go, it is possible to have regression or to have snapbacks. So we'll, we'll have to see. All right, uh, last two questions, one from John, and then I have a question from uh, one of our students who submitted it in advance. So I'll let John go first, and then I'll take the, our student's question. Okay, yeah. very thank you for coming here. It was very thoughtful uh, thinking about uh, Washington, D.C.'s thinking about Taiwan's uh, bright future, brighter in the future. Okay, I want to say uh, two things. One is that uh, since the China starting to do much more pressure, military, airplane, and warship for Taiwan, uh, U.S. Uh, cities, about, I saw about five cities, they've uh, gathered together mostly as uh, Taiwanese American, and they, they demonstrate in front of the Taiwan, of the China embassy, and they want to say, no, the China's uh, invasion to Taiwan. And I think that's very good. So Seattle here, we are planning to do that too. Um, maybe October 15, sometime there, we're going to do it at the big one in West Lake Center. And here, we don't have uh, China embassy here. So our goal will be thanking US to support Taiwan. And second thing will be Stop China's uh, invasion to Taiwan. So, do you think that's a good idea? This is one thing. Uh, and then, the second thing is that I've seen a lot of uh, articles in the US 
they talk about the, like a history of, of uh, Taiwan and China's situation, they always started from uh, like uh, Chiang Kai-shek threat to Taiwan. And that's why there's two governments that's representing China. And so they are trying to compete as who is the real China. Even nowadays, in Taiwan, they still have, uh, in the government uh, circumstances, they still believe they, they are representing China. And that's, uh, I think that's the source of uh, making the US policy hard to take advantage of advancing to make a formal diplomatic uh, relation with Taiwan. And so in, uh, in, in America, there's a lot of Taiwanese Americans. Over the times, they are proposing Taiwan independence movement. And I think it might be these Taiwanese Americans' uh, movement is not strong enough. So it, it never got heard in the American uh, view that there's a group of people is for Taiwan independence. And I think the Thai independence is a, is a solution to, to make it easier for US to recognize Taiwan as a, a real nation. And I know that's not uh, Americans uh, responsibility to, to approve Taiwan independence, but, but it is uh, Taiwanese people in Taiwan and maybe Taiwanese American in America to do the work. Maybe in the interest of time, just the second question. So, you know, kind of the influence of, of Taiwanese independence upon U.S. foreign policy or U.S. policy towards Taiwan. Uh, I would say, as an American, I'm a big fan of self-determination and popular sovereignty. Uh, and I, this is what the Ameri American experiment is all about. It's the basis of the United Nations system. It's the basis of international law. It all boils down to the idea of self-determination. And so, you know, I think President Biden said it right, that the United States does not encourage, does not discourage, that Taiwan's political future is for the people of Taiwan to decide. Thank you. And I, and I agree with that. <laughs> okay, final question. Uh, this is from Eric Wallagoras. Uh, former student of uh, the Jackson School, and he's now working in um, uh, cyber, warfare cyber warfare field, actually, so misinformation, disinformation. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to combine. He sent a number of questions. I'll try to combine them into one. Um, so he's interested in understanding uh, in what ways the United States could assist in the case of cyber warfare. So, um, you know, attacks from Beijing that might stop short of actual kinetic warfare. Um, would, the, would the United States come to the defense of Taiwan in the case of a ma massive cyber attack? Um, what could the Taiwanese government do to shore up its own cyber defenses? The key thing mm -hmm. is making sure the internet can't be taken down. Making sure that in the event of a, a blockade, when we think of blockades, we tend to think of a maritime blockade. You know, we think of the Cuba Missile Crisis and a, you know, maritime quarantine, ships at sea. And in reality, a blockade starts, especially in the 21st century, a blockade starts right here. Yeah. This is a blockade. Can I jump on Twitter and see what's going on in Ukraine today? Yes, I can. I can follow the, the Twitter feed of all the different ministries in Ukraine. I can see what you know, the president of Ukraine is tweeting out. I can see video clips of, of what's going on, right? If I could not see that, if we could not see that, well then that's gonna, very, that, that's gonna be um, very problematic. That's an electronic blockade. That's an information blockade. That is step number one for the PLA, according to all their doctrinal writings, is they wanna black out the information space around Taiwan so that people around the world can't see what's going on. They can't communicate they can't read the Twitter feed of President Tsai or, or any of key legislators or MND or anybody else, right? They can't call their friends. They can't do, you know, uh, FaceTime with their friends in Taiwan. We need to make sure, 
And I think the cyber security community is a big part of this. We need to make sure that could never happen to Taiwan. So maybe that means uh, Starlink, you know, that we get Starlink over there yeah. right away and have that pre-positioned. Maybe it means other capabilities are, are pre-positioned. Maybe there are certain capabilities that the National Security Agency has to back up Taiwan in the event that Taiwanese uh, surveillance radars get knocked out, either by electronic jamming or by missile attacks. Um, maybe there are, are advanced communication capabilities that the U.S. government has that maybe only the U.S. government has and the U.S. military has that can survive in a very intense electromagnetic jamming environment so that um, the Chinese military will never have confidence that they could knock out uh, the internet in Taiwan and, and, um, and black out Taiwan electronically. All right. Um, we only have one minute left, so I want to ask if, uh, Ian, if you have any final thoughts, uh, anything else to share? Um, no, it's just been a great pleasure to have the conversation. I really appreciate all the questions. Um, and it's just, it's a really, after being kind of a hermit and a little antisocial during the pandemic and during the, the course of, of book writing, it's just so much fun to be here at UW and to, ha to have these kind of exchanges and to share research, share ideas and thoughts. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank so, you, Professor. Yeah, so once again, um, uh, Ian Easton's two books, I'll just plug them one more time, The Final Struggle, Inside China's Global Strategy, uh, and his 2017 book, the one that I've read and which I highly recommend, The Chinese Invasion Threat, Taiwan's Defense, and American Strategy in Asia. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. We're, we're really happy to have you here. Thank you.